We are recording the interview of Robert Pierce. This interview is being conducted by Lucas Schroeder from the Wright State University's Veteran Voices Project. This interview is being recorded at the Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. It is 1.13 p.m. on 19 May 2017. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for your service and thank you for coming in here to do thank this you interview too. with us. <laughs> um, so start off, uh, where and when were you born? I was born in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, uh, November the 13th of 1945. Who are or were your parents and what were their occupations? My father was a naval aviator, uh, which is why I was born in Norfolk. Each one of I and my brothers were each born at a different base. Um, he, he died on board the USS Oriskany during uh, uh, <laughs> Korea. Um, my mother uh, was a uh, elementary school teacher, uh, retired from Seminole County, Florida uh, school system. And I, I guess that's it. <laughs> All right. Um, so you mentioned you had uh, several siblings. Uh, who are they and what are their jobs? Uh, my, my next younger brother is Steve Pierce. He is a uh, doctor of microbiology. I, he has his doctorate in, in chemistry. Um, he is retired. Uh, my next brother is Jim Pierce. He is a engineer, electrical engineer. He designs computers for his own company in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Okay. Um, did any of your uh, siblings serve in the military? No, they did not. <laughs> okay. Um, what were you doing before you entered the service? <laughs> I flunked out of college twice. <laughs> um, I did not want to be in school. I had had enough of school. Uh, like everybody else my age, I went to college because if you don't go to college, you're going to be drafted. Um, I got drafted anyway. I received a notice. Um, I quickly went down and enlisted in the Air Force because I was not going to go in the Army and be cannon fodder, which at the time everybody knew that's where we were going. Um, if you en enlist in the Air Force as a medic, you won't go to Vietnam. Well, guess what? <laughs> yes, you will. <laughs> so uh, I'm assuming that's what your MOS was in the My military. MOS was an A90230, which is a medevac medic specialist. Okay. Um, so on that, were you like in Hueys or what? I flew only fixed wings. Um, I flew C-130s, C-123s, and C-7A Caribous. Okay. And uh, so you already mentioned that you were in the Air Force and that you had en enlisted before you could actually get drafted. Um, so that was the main kind of push was just because you didn't want to get drafted in the I, army so you're just like if I'm going to have to serve I'm going to I, go I'm, I'm going to go terms. I was going to join the Navy even following my father's footsteps but at the time the only Navy training base was at Great Lakes and you don't go to Great Lakes from Florida in November so uh, Texas is a whole lot warmer <laughs> yeah. um, so what was training like, if uh, you can remember it? Uh, basic training was like everybody's basic training. You shut up and follow orders. Um, after I left uh, Lackland in uh, San Antonio, I went to Gunner Air Force Base in uh, Montgomery, Alabama for medical training. Um, we had basic medical training, which was 900XO, which everybody in any medical field goes through that. And that was very basic first aid stuff. Uh, after that, we went to the 902 school, which is for specialists. Um, and when we finished, we were 902-30s, which is, uh, you know, you're qualified to, to do a little bit more than put a Band-Aid on. Um, we uh, did some in-service training at uh, Maxwell Air Force Base Hospital, which I've forgotten the name of it. And then when we uh, got our permanent base, we went to Pope Air Force Base. There were several of us from my school that all went together. Uh, when we got to Pope, we did uh, on-the-job training at Womack Army Hospital at Fort Bragg. <laughs> 
and uh, we were uh, upgraded to 90250s, which is uh, an honest to goodness uh, medical specialist. Following that, I was chosen along with another uh, friend to go to AirVac school in Kelly Air Force Base back in San Antonio. And that was uh, strictly medevac uh, training. Uh, and when we were about three quarters of the way through it, we received our orders to Vietnam and uh, they, they gave us credit for graduating even though we didn't complete the, the whole course. Um, so what was that medevac training like? Was it just like using like a lot of like jungle penetrators and things like that? I, or? No, uh, we did not fly helicopters. Uh, the only time I ever flew a helicopter was when I took sea survival and they took me out over the Chesapeake Bay and threw me into the water. Um, we trained on a C-97, which was set up as a medical hospital plane. Uh, C-97 was a cut-down B-29 uh, made into a, uh, an, an air ambulance. Uh, we learned uh, how to, to do anything that you would do in the hospital. We learned how to do on an airplane. Um, it's, it's very difficult to take blood pressure when the engines are, are roaring, so you had to learn how to do it uh, digital, digitally uh, and, and that type of thing. Pay attention to patients while you're in air. Um, so were there any uh, like instructors or uh, like any sort of NCOs that kind of stood out like as you were going through training? Um, uh, Master, for, later on, Master Sergeant uh, Bill Phelps uh, was one of our trainers at Pope. Um, Sergeant Ivy Cottrell was one. Um, Sergeant uh, Reed Painter yeah, um, those were the ones that really stood out that, that kind of took us new guys under their wings, uh, for better or worse at some times. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the way it always ends up working out. Um, so, uh, like, what were they like? Were they just, like, that open-hearted, just kind of like, hey, you guys are new, I'm just going to kind of show you the ropes, or... Well, they showed us the ropes strictly. <laughs> um, they let us know when we were not doing it correctly. Um, uh, but looking back, they really were not near as, as hard on us as they could have been. Uh, you know, a bunch of 18, 19 year old kids, we know everything and don't try and tell us because we know. <laughs> so um, I'm sure they all pulled their hair. <laughs> So I'm assuming like a lot of uh, front wing rest position and yeah, calisthenics. Um, uh, yeah, that was fun. Um, when we were at Pope, uh, we were on uh, alert all the time. The whole time I was there, we were on alert. Um, there was a conflict going on down in the Dominican Republic that some of our people went to. I did not go. But uh, we had a, alert pallets that had complete... Uh, medical facility ready to go. All we had to do was load it on a truck and put it in a, tr in a plane. So a lot of time was spent unpacking to make sure all of the equipment, the medical uh, things, the bandages, everything was in date. If it was not date, it had to go out and be replaced by new stuff. So we did a lot of unpacking, repacking. Uh, we put up GP large tents over and over and over so we would know how to assemble a, a casualty staging facility wherever we were sent. So, uh, you know, we, we didn't do much medical work at Pope except when we were at, uh, at Womack. Uh, mostly we were making sure that our equipment was ready to go. Yeah. And other than um, the training that you said that you had, uh, did you receive any other specialized training? I went to Sea Survival School. Uh, supposedly, if you're flying, you got to fly over water, and there is a chance that you'll go in. So we were taken from uh, somewhere in Virginia, taken out over the Chesapeake Bay and thrown in the Chesapeake Bay with a life raft to float around all day long. Um, <laughs> I was sick. Uh, <laughs> um, Let's see, I had uh, aerovac training. Uh, what else did we do? We had 
basic set up your your camp essentially and how to set up uh, stoves, uh, lanterns, uh, generators, anything for the uh, facilities so it would be ready to go when a patient came in. Okay. Um, and so with all that going on, like you said, you were dropped out of college several times. Um, <laughs> how did that, not wanting to get drafted and everything, how did you adapt to the military life since you kind of were <laughs> kind of forced into it? My hometown was a big naval aviation station, and so I knew several Navy people, uh, mostly they were chiefs, and I, I got some excellent advice from chiefs, uh, shut up, keep your head down, do what you're told to do, don't question. If they say jump, ask how high, just just shut up and do what you're told. And so I really, uh, I really didn't have much trouble. I. Uh, I had attended a boys boarding school when I was in high school, so I had some experience with being with a bunch of other guys and just doing what you're told. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you said you started off in Lackland, then you ended up in Pope Airfield. Um, where did you all serve other than those couple going through training? Um, let's see. Well, of course, ma the majority of my time was spent in Vietnam. Uh, we did have some exercises in uh, Puerto Rico that I took part in. Um, a lot of my time at Pope, uh, I, I spent working in the dispensary or was on alert when the 82nd Airborne had jumps. Uh, they had to have an ambulance and a medic to attend the jumps. And so uh, when my number came up, I was given a cracker, box, cracker box ambulance and told to go to jump zone whichever and wait until everybody had uh, jumped from the plane and hopefully not have to pick anybody up. You know, fortunately, I never did. Yeah, I know how that feels being from 82nd myself. Oh, you were in 82nd. Yes, okay. sir. <laughs> uh, I personally did two years there and then I... Uh, they kicked SMPs out when they reconstructured. Uh, yeah. Um, but uh, so you said you uh, went overseas to Vietnam. Uh, do you have any certain memories that kind of stick out or experiences <laughs> that you wish to share with us? Um. Well, uh, we left Pope on a 130. We went all the way to Vietnam on a 130. It took us five days, uh, 35 flying hours. We left Pope. I went to Travis Air Force Base, from Travis to Hawaii, from Hawaii to Guam, from Guam to Wake, from Wake to Mactan, and then to um, Vietnam, uh, gosh, I forgot what the name of the town we, anyway, we made multiple hops. Uh, we laugh, looking back, all of us look back and think, what were they thinking to send us there on a 130? All of us are deaf because we're sitting there for all these hours with the plane uh, humming in our ears. Yeah, C-130s, they're not very uh, kind to <laughs> the passenger. Um, when we got there, uh, the base was not expecting us. They didn't know who we were, why we were there, and so they put us in a barracks that was only half constructed, and it was during monsoon, so it rained, we all scrounged plastic to put over our cots so that the beds would not be wet. Um, found out later that uh, they didn't really want us there, uh, but one general, and I've got him in my diary, did not want to embarrass anybody by sending us back. So if a general wants you there, you go there. <laughs> So, like you said, they didn't want you there. Isn't like they were just like cold to you, or they just didn't give you like the provisions and stuff that you needed. We, or? we, of course, speaking from a lower rank enlisted person, we pretty much took care of what we needed. Uh, what the officers did, yeah, they may have a completely different outlook on, it, but uh, you know, we, we scrounged like military does, and. Uh, we, we adapted and, and moved on. <laughs> All right. Um, so while you were there, like, what were your, what was your main job while you were uh, overseas? Like, you were saying that you well, were air medevac, <laughs> but... Um, 
Well, our first job was filling sandbags. <laughs> we had a GP large, which I don't know how big it is, 20 by 50. We had to surround it to head height with sandbags in, in the event of an incoming attack, supposedly to stop mortars or rocket attacks. Um, we guesstimated that we filled 10,000 sandbags to, to bag this tent. Shortly after that, I was uh, sent temporary duty to Cameron Bay to work in the hospital there. Um, I was there on the ward for probably a month or so. Uh, then I was sent to Da Nang to work in the hospital there. Um, and f from Da Nang, I had a growth on my knee. The doctor there said that's got to come off, so he sent me to Tachikawa, Japan. I had surgery, I was out for a month, and then I was sent back. So for my first six months, I, I did some flying, but I didn't do as much as some of the other guys did that were there all the time. I seemed like I spent an awful lot of time working on the hospital wards. Um, I worked the hospital at Cameron, I worked at Da Nang, I worked at Pleiku, I worked uh, Dong Ha, Quezon, um, I guess was, those were those were the main ones that, uh, and of course, Dong Ha and Quezon and some of those others, we flew in and out uh, transporting patients. So what was like a day-to-day -day life working in the hospital? Were you just dealing straight with patients or were you just kind of like under like a doctor? Or? Uh, I, I'm sure we had a doctor. I don't recall who he was. I worked uh, mostly under uh, officer nurses. Most of them were captains. Uh, we did regular uh, hospital care from, from bed baths to uh, casting, uh, temperatures, uh, you know, hospital, hospital work. Uh, so like what a typical more, uh, like nurse would uh, do? Uh, if, uh, of course, being enlisted, I was not a nurse, but I was doing nurses' duties. Uh, and, and all of us did because that's, you know, we're all, all military property. You can do anything to a, to a soldier. Someone, someone's got to do it. Might as well make no or so, uh, do it. You know, we, we put casts on, took casts off, uh, checked stitches, checked temperatures. Of course, infection was the big thing. So yeah. we, we did our best to make sure that uh, the infection was kept at a minimum. So when you weren't in the hospitals, did you ever get to do like any flying missions like you were trained to do? Or? I, yes, I, I flew about a hundred what are classified as combat missions because they were under potential fire. Um, uh, I and, and I think everybody else, all the other medics, uh, all were awarded air medals for, uh, for flying combat missions. We might fly anywhere from one patient uh, depending on the seriousness, to uh, a whole airplane full of people, um, depending on if there was a battle or you know what what was needed at the time. Yeah. So, so those missions were they was just like moving patients from like a field hospital to an actual hard they, station. They would go from a field hospital to be stabilized. Yeah. Then they would be brought to us, which is like a mass unit. It's the best thing I can call it. Uh, once they were stabilized, they were brought to us to be scheduled for the next flight that was available. Um, when we had either a serious enough patient or sufficient number, we would call a plane in, whether it was a 130 or a 123, whichever. Uh, we would load the plane and fly it to one of the major hospitals, Cameron, Saigon, Da Nang. <clears throat> um, so... You weren't on the front lines, uh, obviously. Um, so we pretty much covered most of your duties, but like, were there any other random duties that you would have to pull, or did we pretty much cover everything? Um, <laughs> I don't know if, if this is what you I, I was the driver. I drove the ambulance bus uh, okay. while I was working at the hospitals. Uh, when they would fly in, we'd have to take them from the plane to the hospital. Um, some would stay there until they were healed well enough to either go back to their unit or they would be uh, triaged out to go to uh, the hospital ship, uh, Tachikawa, 
uh, Clark, Philippines, one of the bigger hospitals for, for the next step of treatment. Um, from there, they would probably go home from there. Okay. Um, so, what was like the camaraderie like over in Vietnam? Like, were you close with a bunch of people, or was everyone since you were constantly like moving around? Just... The guys that I was with the majority of the time, we had gone through medical school. We had been at Pope. Uh, we're still friends. Uh, we we have maintained contact for fifty years, over fifty years. Uh, so, yes, we we got to be uh, good friends. Um, when we came back from Vietnam, a lot of us were sent to different bases. I happened to go back to Pope again, but uh, we had them go all over the country, and so we lost contact. But uh, you know, over the years, we have regained contact, and uh, it's it's like picking up from old friends that we we never separated. Yeah. Um. So how do you? How did you stay in touch with your like friends and family from back at home while you were overseas? Um, letters, the majority of the time. Uh, when I was in the hospital in Japan, I, I called my wife one time. Uh, it cost a fortune. <laughs> uh, we did not have, of course, cell phones. We didn't have computers. We didn't have, we had, honest to goodness, pen and ink letters. Uh, she and I and some of the others would make uh, cassette recordings, and we'd send those back and forth. But, uh, you know, it was at least a week in between, so by the time it was a week to get there and a week reply, then it, it may have been two weeks, may have been a month before a, an answer came either way. Yeah. But uh, that was that was how we communicated. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> like... Obviously, you were deployed and whatnot, but did you ever have, like, any downtime to just kind of, like, on days off? And, yeah, and yeah, we, we, like had, we had time off um, when we were at Cameron Bay. Uh, it's right on the beach. We went to the beach, uh, and like we do, we got blistered, and, and we paid for it. As if you wear starch fatigues on, on a <laughs> blister, <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. I can imagine. Um, when we were at Da Nang, of course, the show many years ago was China Beach, I think was the show that was on. I never saw China Beach. I wouldn't know China Beach if it walked up to me. Uh, we, we did not go to the beach at uh, Da Nang or any other bases, but uh, Cameron, we did go occasionally. Yeah. Um, so, like, what would you do for recreation, like, on your days off? Obviously, <laughs> go to the beach to, like, swim and whatnot, but... Um, Honestly, we didn't do much. A lot of the guys drank. Uh, beer and wine and whiskey was cheap. Uh, a, a can of beer was a dime. A bottle of whiskey was a dollar. Now, uh, we had an NCO, and I can't remember his name, so it doesn't make any difference. But he functioned drinking a bottle of vodka every night. He... he 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 did okay on his job, so he he could handle it. I I suppose and I'm sure these days he would not do as well, but uh, uh, we we imbibed. I'd be truthful. Uh, we we drank, but uh, most of us did not drink to excess. There were no drugs. I never saw marijuana. I never saw any any of the hard drugs. Um, that came later after we had left. Um, uh, as far as I know, nobody did anything with drugs. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> kind of wrapping up on uh, your war time. Uh, so, you said when the war had ended, or when you were when your uh, term was up overseas. You said you came back to Pope. I came back to Pope and essentially got right back into the same job. Um, I was made a training NCO, uh, supposedly to train the ones that were going to replace us. Whether they went, I, I had no idea. Um, they were the new guys, we were the old guys, and so they kind of stayed together, we kind of stayed together, um, and so uh, there was not as much camaraderie between the old and the new. Yeah. Um, so, 
how long were you there at Polk before your uh, enlistment? Was I was there? I was there a year before I went to Vietnam. I was a year after I got back. Okay, and then so then that pretty much wrapped up your enlistment. You didn't go anywhere else other than no. Nope. I, I I had a very limited <laughs> time in the service. Yeah. <clears throat> um. So you said you were from Virginia did you then go back home to Virginia when you got out I was was born in Virginia I lived in Florida I was I I count Florida as home or used to count Florida as home Uh, my my mother's family was from Sanford Florida all of her brothers and sisters and her, her parents were there my father's family was from Lakeland his family had been there since uh, after the war, which is for a Florida boy, it's it's the Civil War. Uh, my great great grandfather homesteaded Florida after he was released from the Confederacy, so I have a long uh, Florida connection, and that's that's what I call home. Okay, um, so you returned to Florida then directly after service. Yes. Uh, what did you do for a job? Like, did you go back to school or? I had several jobs while I was waiting to start school. I, I did go back to school. I, uh, I did uh, just nitpicky little jobs. I, I built uh, windows, aluminum windows. That, uh, that was boom time for Florida. So I, I built windows to be put in all the houses that were being built. I also worked at a uh, produce farm. Florida used to be and still is to some extent uh, big in winter vegetables. So I worked at one of the farms. Um, I worked at a nursing home trying to use my my medical experience. I was there for a a year and a half or so. Uh, I, I learned quickly that a nursing home is not the place to work uh, as, as a former medic. Uh, because of the health laws, a medic cannot be a medic. A medic is a, a bedpan commando. So, uh, you know, I did the jobs that nobody else wanted to do. Gotcha. And then I and then I did go back to college. <laughs> um, did you get your degree then? Or? I, I did get my degree finally. Um, it took me fr- from the time I got out of high school to the time I got my degree. It took me 13 years, but I did military. I got married. I had children. I had several jobs, but yes, I did finally get a degree. <laughs> um, what was your degree in? Uh, well, that's that's a question. Um, when I I was working at the time, I I had taken a a temporary job as a uh, laboratory helper for the Department of Agriculture um, Division of Food Safety. So I took this job as just an interim job and they had an an opening for an inspector came up and I I said okay I'll take the job because it doubled my pay they said well to have this job you have to have a degree well they didn't specify what type of degree (laughs) so I went to college and I said how many hours do I need to graduate and since I had my junior college AA already they said you need I think it was 65, 68 hours to graduate. Uh, okay, what are the easiest classes I can take because I, I just have to get this degree. So I ended up <laughs> with a Bachelor of Science in General Studies, which means I took all kinds of upper division <laughs> classes that didn't mount to anything, but I got a degree. <laughs> So my wife was very provoked at me. My mother was provoked at me, but they said, get a degree. I got a degree. If you want better, you have to specify. <laughs> so uh, did you stay with that? I, Department sta- of Agriculture I stayed with the long? Department of Agriculture for 32 years. I moved up and gra- uh, graduated. I retired as a supervising inspector for the Division of Food Safety. Okay. Um, so like, what did you do for that type of job like did you just like we collected fresh fruits and vegetables to check for pesticides okay um, later on we also got uh, a USDA contract to check um, fresh fruits and vegetables uh, US and imported for uh, bacterial uh, contamination 
And so, like, you would just, like, randomly, like, pick, like, a crate out of a shipment and uh, then... That, that's essentially exactly what I did. I went to farms. I went to packing houses. I went to warehouses, uh, farmers markets, anywhere where fresh produce was presented to uh, the consumer. Um, Florida had a, a law that we could could draw samples and uh, we we had to offer to pay for them. We couldn't just take yeah. them, but uh, we were authorized to take samples. All right. Um, so how did you readjust the civilian life after your time in the service? I, <laughs> I had some uh, PTSD later on. Uh, we didn't call it that. I, I just... Every time I got on a plane, I would seize up. Um, I, I was very nervous. I had heart palpitations, all that kind of stuff. I, I got over it eventually. Um, both of my brothers are private pilots, so you get over it when you fly with a private, <laughs> private pilot. Yeah. Um, other than that, uh, in the 70s, which was the, the hippie period, I, I kept my hair short. I, I yes sir and no ma'am and uh, that I I tried to dress neatly I tried to be polite I, I uh, you know I was not the most popular person when I was in in college because I I was older than all of them and I I didn't go the the hippie route I, yeah. I had had been there before <laughs> yeah um so. <clears throat> How did, uh, so you said earlier that you still remain in contact with uh, your yes. fellow uh, friends from the military. Um, about how many, just like a hand, small handful? Or? There there were a few. I probably, um, I kept fairly close contact with one. Uh, we we got to know each other in, uh, in medical school and, and stayed in contact off and on all the way. Some of the other ones I picked up, uh, oh, there were probably three or four others that uh, we have gotten to know each other better in the last five years or so. Okay. Um, so are you a member of any uh, mil military or veteran organizations? Uh, like uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars or things like that, no, I'm not. Okay. Um, so we already talked about your job after separation um so how did your wartime experiences affect your life <laughs> um it's hard to say you know i don't know what i would have been if i hadn't been in the service yeah. um my son joined the air force when he was ready he fairly much followed my footsteps he quit college um bummed around for a while and, and joined the service and, and did fairly well in it. Uh, so maybe that affected him. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <Okay>. <clears throat> um, so what are some of the life lessons that you've learned from your time in the military? Never volunteer. <laughs> um, treat people the way you'd like to be treated, even though it doesn't always work out that way. Um, I, I personally never had anybody call me names, throw things at me, spit on me like, like many of them did. That was later on. Um, but, uh, try not to, not to get all hung up on, I'm going to get you back. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, so how was your time in Vietnam as well as your military experience in general uh, impacted your feelings on war? Viet Vietnam was a stupid war. It, it was not, should not have been fought and it was not fought correctly from my viewpoint. Um, you know, I used to be on the flight line when the planes would come back from uh, bombing North Vietnam and I'd watch four F-4Cs land after their mission and I thought at the time if you're gonna run a war you don't send four planes you send 400 planes you don't say you can't bomb here you've got to bomb here you can't do you've got you don't do that they should have learned that in World War II that um, it was 
from my viewpoint, it was a very poorly run war. Um, but then I look at some of the ones that are going on now, and it really hasn't changed much. Uh, the military is the military, and it always has been, and it always will be. Yeah. Um, so what message would you like to leave for future generations who will hear or view your interview? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, support your president even then he, when he's not right. <laughs> he's doing the best he can do uh, from Johnston, Johnson, all the way to Trump. They're human. Uh, everybody that's running the war is human. They're going to make mistakes. We're going to make mistakes. Do the best you can do and, and hope it works out. <laughs> Um, is there anything else you wish, uh, or that we haven't discussed that you wish should be added to this interview? Gosh, I don't know what. Um, I was glad I, I served. I don't know if I would want to do it again. Um, I hate to say I enjoyed it, but uh, it was an experience I wouldn't want to trade. But I don't know if I'd want to do it again, and I don't know if I'd recommend to my grandchildren to, to enlist. That's their decision uh, when it comes time for them. If, if they think that's the right thing for them, then I, I will certainly support them. Yeah. Um, anything else? Or let's about wrap it up. I don't know what else I could add. I think you have, <laughs> you have pretty, All right. well, pretty much well, hit Thank you, Robert. Thank, well, thank you for your Thank service. you for having me. Yep. Thank you for coming in. And you're welcome to that for whatever it's worth.